Welcome to Farm Connections. I'm your host, Dan Hoffman. Today we visit the largest organic educational conference in the United States, which takes place in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Kent TC talks about the expected decline in cash rental rates, and Lynn Kettleson talks about the grants Minnesota Corn is offering for innovations in agriculture. Up first is our visit to the Scottish Highland Cattle Show. Stick around, Farm Connections is next. Welcome to Farm Connections with your host, Dan Hoffman. Farm Connections, sponsored by Alcorn Clean Fuel, a farmer-owned cooperative in Claremont, Minnesota, produces ethanol, high-protein livestock feed, and corn oil, and beverage-grade carbon dioxide for resale to benefit its members and their communities. Absolute Energy, a locally-owned facility, produces 115 million gallons of ethanol annually. Proudly supporting local economies in Iowa and Minnesota. Absolute Energy, adding value to the neighborhood. Prow Company, a hands-on commercial property leasing company. Leasing commercial properties in Rochester, Minnesota since 1952. Realtors and brokers welcome. Prow Company. Today we traveled to Austin, Minnesota at the Mauer County Fairgrounds to learn a little bit about Scottish Highland cattle. And with us to do that is Mark Schultz. Welcome, Mark. Hi, Dan. You've got a lot happening here. Young people, people a little older than young people, cattle all over. What's really going on today? Well, we've got a show to, to showcase our, our favorite breed, everybody here's favorite breed, Scottish Highland cattle. Um, we've got a lot going on. This is a family event. Um, we started our day with uh, a junior show, and that just concluded. We had uh, heifer classes and, and showmanship, which is a really important learning tool for, for our young people that are gonna be our future breeders. Um, and then this afternoon, we'll start off our open show with a bagpiper, which is a tradition in all Highland shows. And then we'll roll into heifers, bulls, uh, cow-calf classes. Um, we'll also do um, some group classes, which are produce a dam, get a sire, that kind of thing. And then uh, we'll finish up the day with our market classes because in the end, that's what we're raising as beef for the consumer. Well, you mentioned tradition. There must be a lot of strong and long-lasting tradition with this breed. You bet. Um, the, the bagpipes is one. Uh, just the look of the cattle. Um, they're, they're one of the oldest breeds around, heritage breeds. Um, you see a lot, um, you've got the horns and the hair. Uh, to be a registered Scottish Highland, they have to have their horns on. They can't be dehorned. Um, so just a lot, of, a lot of tradition in that and uh, a lot of pride in, in the people that have these animals. Mark, what are the judges looking for today? You bet. Um, our judge this morning talked a lot about structure and mobility, and that's key in, in the longevity of a Highland cow. Um, we have breeders here that have cows that are still having calves at 18 to 20 years old. And so the more calves you're getting out of that cow, the more your money you're making off that cow. And so he's, he's looking for mobility. Do the, do the animals, do the back feet come and cover the tracks of the front feet when they stride out? That shows good mobility. Um, they're also, the judge is also looking for, um, you know, can the animal carry the, the structure that they have or the carry the muscle, do they have the structure to do that? Our cattle are a little bit shorter, as, as most people will point out, but they're not really that much lighter than most animals as far as weight goes. But they do, they do, they are shorter. Uh, they grew up in the, Scot the highlands of Scotland, so climbing hills was, was essential for, you know, short, short animals essential for that. Um, but we look for, um, you know, a, a nice top line, uh, straight top line, nice set of shoulders that balances with a nice rear end. Um, and of course, a nice loin, because that's where you're gonna get your steaks from. Um, but those are the types of things that, that a judge is looking for in, uh, in our show animals. But we also, you know, that structure and mobility, that's key for our production animals as well. So we like to think that a judge is gonna look for both characteristics. And, you know, he may say that's a pretty cow out there, but she also needs to be functional and needs to have a calf every year and produce a nice calf. So Somebody's got to buy the feed, right? That's right, that's right. And you know, one of my smallest cows is, is probably one of my best producers as far as getting a calf out of her. And uh, she eats less. Um, so those are, those are good traits um, to look for in, in your cattle. 
Um, the judge also pointed out this morning about our F1 crosses. Um, you're seeing more and more of that in our shows because uh, to get our breed out there amongst um, the industry, we have to show what the Highland cow or the Highland bull can do for the other breeds. And people are seeing that, and especially with what we're showing today, uh, the judge was very impressed with some of the F1 crosses we saw out there. They have a little bit more growth than the Highland cow. Highlands are a little bit, a little bit slower maturing animals. Uh, we don't breed until they're two years old. Uh, but then again, we're still raising calves out of those cows at 18 to 20 years old, you know, as long as their structure stays intact. That's incredible for that long a time. Many, many people breed out in three, or cull out in three to five years. That's right, right that's right. And so the other thing is, we also look for on, you'll see the cow-calf pairs in there later on today, and the judge is gonna be looking for a good quality udder on that animal. He'll ask how old the cow is and evaluate her udder, because if the udder falls apart on you, that cow's not gonna make it to that 18 to 20 years old and, and still be raising a calf every year. How about milk ability or milk production ability, and then also colors? You bet. Um, Highland cattle typically have a smaller calf. Our average weight on calves is about 65 pounds, but I've found um, that they'll, they'll put on 20 pounds in that first week because the, the butter fat is so high on these, on these uh, cows. Um, my first time I, I did the weights, I thought, man, I must have weighed something wrong, you know, 20 pounds in the first week, and I found that to be very consistent, 15 to 20 pounds. So, uh, yeah, they, they have a real high, high butter fat and really get those calves going. Two to three pounds a day a gain. Yeah, right, right. Wow. So, you know, that does, obviously that does tail off as sure. they get a little older, but, um, and then you asked about color. Um, Highlands come in seven different colors, and I'll see if I can get all seven here. We've got red, which is the dominant color. Um, that's primarily what you see. Different shades of red you'll see. Um, and uh, yellow is another color, which is kind of a, just a lighter shade of red. Then we have white, we have black, we have brindle, um, what am I forgetting? Silver, and no. One of my friends, Dunn, which is a brown. So those are our different colors. Um, and we had somebody study our color patterns because somebody, you know, they were, people would say, I'm breeding this to this to get this color. It doesn't happen that way. So as much as you're surprised by whether it's a bull or a heifer when the calf is born, you're also surprised by what color you get. So um, the only thing that they could really say was the brindle color was a wild gene. And so if you have the wild gene in your genetics, you get more apt to get a brindle, which are fairly, I'd say more rare than the other colors. But um, we've had just about every color on our farm now. We just had a silver this year, which was new to us, which is a kind of a white, a dirty white color. But instead of having pink hooves and nose, they'll have black nose and hooves. And that's what makes them a silver. Makes things interesting. It does, it does. It's always, it's always a, uh, waiting in anticipation in the spring when we start having calves or, or a couple of fall calvers that we have. So, Well, the name might tip us off, but where does the breed originate from? It, it does originate from the, the highlands of Scotland, and uh, they've been in the U.S. Uh, since the late 1800s. Uh, we have one of the oldest uh, registration books on, on file, um, but they've been around the U.S. Uh, mainly in the in the northern tier states, but you do, do see some as far as Texas and Florida. Uh, but they do like our our uh, cool climate up here. With that long hair and, and thick hide, I can imagine that. You bet. And and with since you mentioned the long hair and the thick hide, that's one of the characteristics of our breed as well. Is it's a very lean meat. Since they have a double coat, they have the long guard hair and the, and the thick undercoat, they don't develop the back fat that a commercial breed does. So you, you, uh, you tend to have a lot leaner meat for those people that are looking for that. Also with the highlands, they're very good at converting grass to meat. So those breeders that are looking, uh, maybe have a small acreage that want to grow some uh, their own beef, highlands are an excellent choice for that because they're good converters of grass to meat. So. Those are some things about Highlands that we enjoy. When did the breed actually come to the United States and why? Probably around the late 1800s. Um, the the uh, story is that they, they came on a, a rail car and the first ones were out in South Dakota. And so 
I think what people were looking for at that time was something that was going to be hardy out on, on some of the rangeland out in the western states. And, and there's no hardier animal than the Scottish Highland to be out on the, that, in that kind of weather. Um, and so then it just kind of expanded from there. And, uh, it, and we still have gentlemen that are, are or, or ladies that are, are breeders and ranchers out west that will take a commercial cow and maybe put a highland bull on them or vice versa. So they want that, a little bit of extra hair and that, and that vigor that the highland brings to them. You also spoke a little bit about the hide, the horns, and right. the meat. Right. Where are these products marketed? Most, you'll see most of the uh, meat for highlands is direct marketed from the farmer. Um, as, because you have the hide and the horns, they don't fit the typical production mode if you were gonna sell them at a sale barn or to a production facility. So most people, when they get into this, they know they're gonna have to direct market or sell to somebody that is direct marketing animals, Highlands specifically. And so those are kind of the outlets for the beef. Um, and you will see around, some of the people have Highland hides on their tables in here. Uh, we have a couple that we use for uh, rugs on our hardwood floor. Um, so it's a, there are some byproducts, if you will, to a Highland. The horns as well, a lot of people use them for decoration. And you see Texas Longhorns, well, I, I prefer Scottish Highland horns myself. They're, they're really pretty. In the United States, how many animals are in the breed? I would say we probably have about 2,500 registered animals. But, um, and this is just a guess for me, but I would guess there's probably at least twice to three times as many Highlands that are unregistered in the U.S. And so that happens in our region as well. Um, not everybody joins the association. Not everybody sees the value in registering animals. They may choose to just do meat and they say, I, I'm just going to have mine unregistered. So I would guess there's probably, again, twice as many or three times around. If someone wants to find out more about the association, is there a website to go to? There is. There's, um, there's uh, North Central Highland Cattle Association. There's also our national organization, which would be the American Highland Cattle Association. And, and I think if you just Google those, they'll, they'll pop up to the surface. And you'll also see the different other regions, the, the Northeast, the Midwest, the Heartland Association, the, the Northwest. And so uh, each of those have, regions have their own uh, groups of people and, and we swap back and forth ideas and, and stuff. So. Mark, thanks for sharing your story. You bet, I appreciate it, Dan. Good luck with the show. Great. Thanks. Stay with us. Kent TC is talking about cash rental rates next. Thanks, Dan. Most land rental rates in southern Minnesota and northern Iowa increased by 30 to 50 percent from 2010 to 2014 before declining slightly from in 2015 and 2016. This is based on farm management data from the University of Minnesota and Iowa State University. Even though cash rental rates declined somewhat in 2015 and 16 compared to their peak rates, the rental rates were still too high for many producers to show a profit from corn and soybean production on a majority of the cash rented farmland. Farm operators and landowners now face some difficult decisions as they try to negotiate equitable land rental rates for 2017. The USDA National Ag Statistics Service, or NAS, average cash rental rates for non-irrigated cropland in Minnesota declined by about 8% from 2014 to 2016. The largest overall two-year declines in land rental rates from two th in those two years were approximately 13% in southeast Minnesota crop reporting district and just over 10% in the south central district. However, more, both of those districts averaged over $250 per acre in 2014, which were the highest land rental rates in the state. The University of Minnesota 2016 land rental survey showed similar trends in cash rental rates across southern Minnesota. The rates dropped by just under 6% from 2014 to 15, with a similar decline expected from 2015 to 16. Most counties in southern Minnesota averaged between $200 and $250 per acre cash rent in 2015 and $190 to $240 for 2016. Iowa State University also does an annual land rental survey in all counties in Iowa, which with the results analyzed by county as well as crop reporting district. 
the 2016 Iowa survey showed average land rental rates in the three northern crop, Iowa crop reporting districts declined from about 270 to 280 per acre in 2014 down to about 240 to 250 per acre in 2016, a, representing a two-year decline of about 10%. An alternative to the very high land rental rates for landowners and farm operators would be to consider a flexible cash lease. This allows the landowner to share an extra profit for the year if there is a rapid increase in crop prices that occurs during the year, such as occurred a few years ago. The economics of corn and soybean production in 2015 and 16 have changed considerably from the previous four to five years in most areas of the U.S. due to much lower commodity prices and greatly reduced profit margins, if there was any profit at all. Based on the most current projections, the tight profit margins in crop production are likely to continue in 2017 and beyond unless we have a crop shortage in the U.S. or elsewhere in the world. Landowners and farm operators need to work and communicate cooperatively to arrive at equitable land rental rates that are satisfactory to all parties. It is important to put these land rental agreements in writing and to consider alternatives to traditional cash rental leases such as flexible leases. This has been Ken Tisi and we'll talk to you next time. We're at the Moses Organic Farming Conference in La Crosse, Wisconsin, and with me is the former president of this group. Good to meet you. Well, thanks for being with us, Carmen Fernholz. It's really interesting to see the excitement and all the people here at this conference. What's going on? It's the evolving uh, of farming, the evolving of our food system, and the evolving of farmers themselves. Uh, like I've visited with other people, we see the younger generation of farmers starting to pick up the wand, the baton, or whatever you want to call it, and wanting to become a part of it. That's the first thing. We see uh, the enthusiasm from the food processors, from the end users, uh, starting to play out here. And uh, we see just what I would say uh, the total changing of our food system in this country and actually worldwide. Well, this conference says it's the Moses Organic Farming Conference. Okay. What's Moses? Moses, first of all, it stands for Midwest Organic Sustainable Education Services. Uh, Moses is an organization that does not have membership, but it is run by a board of directors and an executive director with a staff. Our main objective or main uh, thrust is sponsoring or putting on this conference. This uh, conference has been going on for some 27 years now. 27. And so um, that's our biggest thrust. And besides that, Moses does sponsor some uh, smaller workshops throughout the uh, Midwest area here during the summer months and field days during the summer months. The major thrust of Moses, including this conference, is farmer education. We want to continually educate farmers on organic systems and how we can better become sustainable through organic management. Why is it to ha important to have an organization like this and to help farmers? I think it's tremendously important for several reasons, but the most important reason is that at a conference like this, if you walk up and down the trade floor and in the halls, you'll see little groups of producers uh, sharing information. And that's, all, uh, that's been a characteristic of organic farmers from way back when. Uh, uh, like I've been certified organic since 1975, and that's always been a characteristic that I've noticed among the mentors mm -hmm. that I had over the years. They, they didn't hold this information close to them. They wanted to share it. And I think this conference provides the absolute best venue for that opportunity to share. Well, that's a lot of history since 1975. <laughs> what changes have you seen during that time frame? One of the biggest changes I've seen is the acceptance of organics. And I always talk to myself and uh, think about these things. And sometimes I wonder, 
am I doing the right thing? And what helps me a lot is I look back to the mid-70s when I started to where people didn't even say what we always said called the O word, uh, organic. People would, uh, would say yeah, those are the foodie, or the uh, back to the land people and whatever. But today you see the acceptance of an organic system. When I have a young farmer who lives five miles from me call me up and say, I'd like to come over and have you teach me how you're farming, then I know the acceptance is there. Because in the 1970s when I was doing this, a few of my friends even were shaking their heads. And now today, that's not there. Is there room for more organic farmers? Definitely, much more room for organic. Uh, when we look at, in fact, at this conference, we're meeting a lot of the buyers, the end users of organics, and they're telling us, we want to look ahead three to five years because we see a total growth in organics and we want to be part of it. So we want to start laying the groundwork today so that if we do adopt it as part of our main operations, that we can in fact source reliable, continuing product. What's driving that growth? What is driving the growth to me is, number one, the millennials. They have made the connection between health and what they eat. And the other sector of society that has driven it are the baby boomers, who uh, a good friend of mine told me years ago, when you reach 50, you begin to watch what you put in your mouth. Because at that age, you want to live longer, and so you start concerning yourself with health, and you connect health with what you eat. And so you've got the baby boomers reaching 60 to 65. Their children, who are the millennials, are mixing with them. And so those two sectors of society are the ones that are really driving the whole food health, the whole organic movement. Fascinating. What advice do you have for young farmers trying to look at getting a start? Find, uh, I guess the first thing is find yourself a mentor. And they're out there. Uh, the other thing is, Believe in yourself. If you think what you're hearing and seeing is the right thing, go for it. Today you have the help that people like me did not have back in the 70s. We've written books. You can go on the internet and find out all kinds of information. Universities are giving all day workshops. The information, the help is there, and probably more importantly, the markets are there. So you can, in fact, make it that way. Well, it appears like there's a great number of people that have interest in your conference and organic farming. Has there been growth over the years? Definitely growth. In fact, uh, I've been on the Moses board for something like three or four years. And in the last two or three years, we have already been, are, are already being forced to think of a possible change of venue in the sense that we may have mm -hmm. to look at a larger facility. And uh, we definitely would like to stay in this uh, lacrosse area. But uh, if, if the numbers continue to grow, like this year we're exceeding 3,500, and we're probably at the capacity of this facility, we have to look at some others. Because we started out with 1,000, 1,500, and we're talking over 20, 25 years. Mm -hmm. And today, 3,500. And anticipating uh, the growing interest in organics, I think the numbers are going to continue to grow. And it's just a lot of what we talked about already. The, the interest and the growth in organics just forces that to happen. Very interesting, Carmen. Thank you for spending time with us. You're welcome. More coming up on Farm Connections. Innovation has always been a big part of agriculture, and many new ideas come from farmers themselves. That's why the Minnesota corn growers have created the Innovative Grant Program. The first year of the program proved so successful, they're expanding it this year. Grants of up to $7,000 will be given to Minnesota farmers who have the best ideas. Adam Burr is the executive director of Minnesota Corn. Specifically, we're focusing on things related to nutrient management and cover crops, and so we put a call for proposals out last year. We had six recipients last year. Half of them or so focused on tweaking machinery to put down cover crops. Uh, it's hard to get cover crops established in Minnesota. And so you draw on that ingenuity of the farmer to figure that out. 
The corn leader says they're getting some very creative ideas. And a nice part of the program is the ideas will be shared. Some of them take part and we help provide a field day so that they can reach out to their neighbors and demonstrate to their neighbors, uh, you know, here's, here's how I figured it out. Here's what uh, you can do too on your operation. So it's that peer-to-peer -peer contact that I think works so much. Who better to talk to a farmer than another farmer about the solution he came up with rather than us as staff or a university person. I mean, we work great with the university, but I think at the end of the day, farmers talking to farmers is the best way to spread some of these practices. Well, it's very important and that we continue to be innovative as, as farmers and having this program available to producers and uh, to be able to continue research is very important. Farmers have always been innovative. Anyone that grew up on a farm probably can remember their dad fixing implements with baling wire or fixing just about anything else. Now the Minnesota corn growers are rewarding farmers for their creative ideas, and it's something very interesting to look at as we move ahead in agriculture. This is Lynn Kettleson reporting. The diversity of agriculture in our region is immense. Thanks for tagging along as we sampled just a portion of it today. See you next time on Farm Connections.